And aren't you afraid of this inflatable mattress hanging above the ground? Sean, Brian's buddy, pushed him on the shoulder as soon as he landed. He who fears the wolf should not enter the forest. Brian grinned, laying the paraglider on the grass so that it could be collected without tangling the slings. Brian and Sean had been taking tourists on extreme tours to the mountains for five years. The guys had already tried everything that could tickle their nerves and make them shake. Rafting, rope jumping, mountain bikes, long hikes, mountaineering. But what interested Brian the most was paragliding. He spent almost the whole summer in the mountains, flying, trying, learning, getting hurt when landing. Once he dislocated his elbow when he caught his paraglider on a tree and fell from a couple of metres high. However, the air, freedom and the charm of the mountains beckoned the stubborn guy who flew where others were afraid and stayed under the clouds for so long that his fingers began to numb from the cold. Brian started taking tourists when he was already convinced of his own skills. Sean was the driver and organiser. Brian was the coordinator and implementer of extreme entertainment. Oh, Brian, finish your extreme stuff. If you fall from such a high, you'll die, scolded his mother, Mrs. Sailor. But the guy liked to live like that. It was a hundred times better than sitting in a stuffy office and poking at buttons. Dangerous? Yes, so what? Someone sneezing in a public place is more dangerous these days. So now I can't go out? Of course not. You have a great education. Go to the bank, make a career, his mother persisted. And when the kids come, will you go to the mountains too? No wife, no kids either, Mum. Why are you bothering me again? Brian sighed tiredly. Talks about the dangers of paragliding and the lack of seriousness in the tourist business repeated regularly, even though it brought him decent money. Brian met Whitney on a social network. He was bored one winter evening, flipping through the newsfeed when he came across the page of a pretty girl. They went on a couple of dates and the girl was impressed by Brian's boldness and passion. Later, he took her on several trips, even offered to ride on a paraglider, but the cowardly Whitney refused. Everything happened quickly, and less than nine months later he proposed to her. Brian wasn't bothered by the fact that his chosen one was quite spoiled and capricious. At least she always waited for him at home and didn't criticise his hobby. The man was grateful for that and didn't mind that Whitney wasn't working. Let her do what she likes, he said to his mother. I earn enough for both of us. Meanwhile, life was flowing at its own pace. Brian and his wife had been living together for a year and a half. Brian's mother gave the couple her two-bedroom apartment and she bought a small house in the countryside with her savings. She moved in with the condition that grandchildren would soon follow. Brian laughed and Whitney rolled her eyes. Children were not in her plans for the next 100 years. Despite warnings that Brian's hobby of flying would not end well, fate had other plans. On their way back from the mountains in late August, the weather was rainy and gloomy. Sean drove the minibus with extreme caution, slowing down at the turns of the Serpentine Road. Brian, tired from the busy programme and early wake-up, dozed off in the passenger seat. Everything changed instantly when a reckless local driver suddenly appeared on the opposite side of the road. Sean turned the steering wheel to avoid a collision, causing the minibus to tip over and crash into a pillar and concrete barrier. Brian was trapped, squeezed almost in half between the roof and the dashboard. Fortunately, the other passengers suffered minor injuries, such as abrasions, bruises and a few broken fingers. Sean dislocated his arm and got a concussion. It took the emergency services almost 40 minutes to rescue the unconscious Brian. He was urgently sent to the capital of the region, where he had at least a chance to stay alive. The operation was successful, but Brian was left paralysed below the waist. The accident not only took away Brian's mobility, but also his beloved job. Whitney mourned the loss of her beautiful and comfortable life. Her perception of Brian changed almost immediately. No longer seeing him as a hero of a source of support and leadership, 
she now viewed him as a burden. Brian experienced a prolonged crisis of mobility loss and fell into a state of depression. The doctor prescribed a set of exercises for Brian, which should have had a positive effect over time. However, due to his frustration and helplessness, he struggled to start doing them. Brian greeted his wife, who had returned from work, but Whitney was not in a good mood. Lately, this state had become the norm for her. She had to wake up early, work, do household chores, and still take care of her disabled husband. How was your day? Brian asked, struggling to take the bag of groceries from her. Disgusting, Whitney sharply replied, taking off her coat. Brian went to the door, placed the bag with groceries on the floor near the refrigerator, and opened the door. Give me that, otherwise you'll definitely be dropping something. Whitney grabbed the milk out of his hand. Why are you so rude? Brian looked at her reproachfully. And who would clean it up then? You? Whitney hissed. She felt irritated with her obliging husband. He understood his limitations and tried not to create unnecessary inconvenience for his wife. At first, Brian felt ashamed, but later he accepted his condition and stopped tormenting himself with guilt. There are some cooked meatballs in the bag. Heat them up yourself. I'm tired. Whitney clenched her temples with her hands and went into her bedroom. She sat down on the edge of the bed, feeling exhausted, lethargic and drained. This was not the life she had envisioned when she married the handsome athletic and adventurous Brian. But now he was deprived of his hobby and income, and she had to work for both of them, running all over the city, showing cheap apartments to poor families. This was not how Whitney planned to spend her young age. Her husband had already been in the wheelchair for six months. At first, they lived off their savings, but they soon ran out. Whitney kept putting off looking for a job. At the age of 25, she had no significant work experience. She did a part-time model for online clothing stores and ran a blog as a stylist, despite having a good education in the hospitality industry. Whitney's real estate business was not going well. Everything about it irritated her from the very beginning. Difficult people, confusing payment processes, running around, countless phone calls, and the need to persuade someone and bend over backward. What kept her in such an unsuitable position? The charming director and owner of the agency, Whitney, fell under Ned's charms when she stopped believing in the doctor's optimistic predictions about her husband. There was a constant struggle in Whitney's head between duty, feelings, selfishness and conscience. And tonight, selfishness and inner desires triumphed. Whitney finally realised that she no longer cared about others' opinions, that she didn't want to support her disabled husband until retirement and erase her entire life. She deserved happiness too, the joy of being a woman, not a workhorse burdened with responsibilities. The decision came instantly. Are you going somewhere? Brian asked, watching his wife pack the bag with their belongings. Yes, Whitney nodded briefly. We're going to your mum's. Brian raised an eyebrow in surprise and smiled slightly. What kind of nonsense is this? The daughter-in-law wants to go to her mother-in-law's house? I can't take it any more. Do you understand? I can't. I'm beautiful, young. I want romance. I want to see a decent man beside me. I want care and affection, not to look after an invalid. Whitney, I'll get out of the wheelchair, Brian interrupted her. The doctor said there's a chance. But maybe you won't get up. I'm fed up. Whitney threw several more t-shirts into the bag and zipped up the zipper with a precise movement. You're staying at your mother's. We need to live apart at least for a few months. Six months, I don't know. It was a frosty morning in the village. Sparrows chirped cheerfully as they hopped around. The ground was covered in hoarfrost. Whitney opened the gate and pushed the wheelchair along the narrow path to the porch. Brian's mother appeared at the door, wearing a down shawl. Are you here for long, Whitney? asked Mrs. Saylor, brushing off invisible snowflakes from her son's jacket. Brian will be here for a while but I am returning to the city. I need to work, replied Whitney curtly. 
Before Mrs. Saylor could respond, Whitney said her goodbyes, closed the door and got back to the cab. Two months had passed, and the end of March was approaching. During this time, Whitney never returned for Brian. Initially, he called and messaged her himself, but over time, his wife stopped answering the phone and responded curtly on social media. Brian realised that she had abandoned him, callously and without any remorse. His mother shook her head, concerned about the apartment her son had left behind. "'Well done, Whitney,' lamented Mrs. Saylor. "'She burdened me with your husband, and now she lives in my apartment without a care in the world. "'Brian, file for divorce, I'm telling you. "'Mum, everything will work out. Just stop it.' "'Brian waved off his mother's insistence, "'but his belief in his own words dwindled with each passing day. "'Apathy and longing consumed Brian. "'He struggled with his own helplessness.' unable to perform most of the household chores. Walks became infrequent, as it was difficult to navigate the wheelchair down a couple of porch steps. Once, when Mrs. Saylor was struggling with the wheelchair, her elderly neighbour, Mr. Dunkelman, peered over the fence. "'Oh, Mrs. Saylor, why are you carrying him?' the old man shouted indignantly in his straightforward manner. "'Hello, Mr. Dunkelman,' the woman greeted." Well, how else can we do it? Can you help instead of wagging your tongue? The neighbour, agile and far from senile, quickly came up and helped lower the wheelchair down the steps. At the same time, he inquired about what had happened to Brian. Oh, it's a trouble. Mr. Dunkelman scratched the back of his head, pushing his knitted cap to the side. But I've got an idea. Tomorrow I'll come and make an adaptation so that you can move in and out. But it would be better if you could get back on your feet finally, okay? Brian smiled slightly and sighed. After work, Whitney opened her laptop and sat down on the soft couch. Without looking, she dismissed a message from her husband with another annoying question. Today, Ned, the director of the agency, finally noticed her and invited her to have coffee together at lunch. It was not in vain that Whitney wore short skirts and spent several hours each morning in front of the mirror. The determination with which Whitney pursued her goal of seducing the director was worthy of applause. The girl went with her boss to a coffee shop and made it clear in every possible way that she wouldn't mind continuing their communication in a more informal place. Ned caught the hint and at the end of the lunch invited the pretty employee to dinner at a restaurant at the end of the week. His suit is clearly not from a local shop, Whitney muttered to herself, looking at photos of her boss on social media, and he has nice watches and cufflinks. Her eyes burned with admiration, but also with self-satisfaction. Since she entrusted her husband to the care of her mother-in-law a month ago, Whitney realised that her life wasn't so bad after all. Work no longer stressed her out, and cooking and cleaning became rare occasions. The pictures of the boss told Whitney what she wanted to know. Ned, in his 35 years, was the owner of a nice house in the suburbs and two cars. Whitney reclined contentedly on the back of the sofa, scrolling through options for outfits for a future date in her head. Her sick husband and the fact of their legal marriage didn't slow her down one bit. The day came when Ned came to pick her up in his car, and in the morning, Whitney woke up in her lover's house. Ned offered her coffee and asked if she wanted to go to the exhibition in a couple of days. Whitney coquettishly agreed. Everything went according to plan. At work, they decided not to advertise their relationship, although it was difficult to hide something in a female collective. Soon, the whole office surrendered to the fact that the boss had a young mistress. The first day of April was unusually warm. The sun seemed determined to make all the plants grow and blossom in a single day. Mr. Dunkelman was adding a sturdy and smooth ramp to the porch. Nice weather, he said to Brian, who was sitting in his wheelchair, with the cat stomped purring and kneading his sweater with his paws. Now we'll fix it here. Knock and you'll ride there, like a racer, the elderly neighbour said contentedly, wielding a hammer. 
Yes, but I'm not going to violate traffic rules, Brian smiled. Lately, he had perked up slightly, perhaps due to the weather or maybe because he had finally accepted that Whitney had practically abandoned him. Additionally, Brian had found a way to alleviate his hated idleness. He decided to write a book about his extreme hobbies. He found a blank notebook in his desk and began to jot down ideas. Brian had never written any text before, except for school essays. However, he tackled the task quite vigorously. It's done, Mr. Dunkelman explained, looking at the completed work. Well, Brian, try to go in for yourself. Brian carefully pushed his wheelchair down the improvised ramp and then got upstairs. Well, that's good, the elderly neighbour said. Grandpa, came a voice from behind the fence. Are you there? Let's go to lunch. I've made soup and vegetables. Brian turned his head at the sound. A girl in a striped sweater waved from behind the gate. Her blonde curls poked out from under her cap, and her bright blue eyes were visible even from several metres away. It's my granddaughter, Tammy, Mr. Dunkelman nodded imperceptibly to Brian. She's come for the weekend. She's studying in the city. Grandpa, come on. Everything will get cold, the girl demanded. I'm coming, I'm coming. Why are you shouting? The elderly man waved good-natured at her. Say hello to your mum. I'll see you later. The beam under the roof here is bad. It would be good to fix it. Mr. Dunkelman gathered his tools in a bag, waved to Brian, and went outside the gate to his granddaughter. April continued to be warm and windless. Brian had not written to Whitney for a long time, but he was actively working on the book. The second notebook was already completed. Brian, can you go to the store yourself? We're out of salt, shouted his mother from the kitchen. I can't leave or the pies will burn. The path to the grocery store was simple. A straight asphalt path, 250 metres long and a step-free entrance. OK, Brian replied. He quickly put on his jacket, checked his pocket for change and rolled towards the gate, happy to help. The tyres of the wheelchair rustled quietly on the already dry asphalt. Brian moved slowly, observing the village. In the grey and dreary winter it was depressing, but when the sun came out the village came to life. Brian reached the store without any problems, bought salt and rolled back. Almost home, he heard a pitiful meow from the neighbour's roof. He looked up and saw his cat sitting there. Brian had noticed before that the cat used to climb up there using the scaffolding. The neighbours had been doing some repairs in the attic and the scaffolding had been there all winter. But now that the repairs were over, the scaffolding had been removed, leaving the poor cat trapped on the roof. There was no nearby tree, lower roof or suitable fence for the cat to climb down. How do I get you down now? That's a problem. Brian looked at the cat with a questioning gaze. He tried knocking and calling out to the neighbours, but they were not at home. The feeling of helplessness and inadequacy washed over him again. Poor cat, a familiar voice rang out, interrupting Brian's thoughts. Standing nearby was Mr. Dunkelman's granddaughter, squinting as she looked at the roof. Yes, I'm thinking about how to rescue him, Brian cautiously nodded. Yes, we can't leave the mustachioed one in a lurch, the girl said, and placed a bag of food on Brian's lap. Then she rolled up her sleeves and fearlessly climbed over the fence to the neighbour's yard. Tammy went around the house and found an old ladder in the shed. The ladder wasn't enough to step onto the roof, but it was enough to reach out and grab the cat by its paw. When the cat was rescued, Tammy handed him into Brian's waiting hands. She then carefully returned the ladder to its place and skillfully left the neighbour's yard, leaving no trace of their sudden intrusion. Thank you. I don't know how I would have managed it on my own, Brian said, handing the girl the bag of groceries. My name's Tammy, by the way. The girl introduced herself during the conversation. Probably you would have waited for another heartfelt passerby. My name's Brian, the young man replied, feeling embarrassed. Let me help you, Tammy offered, and opened the gate so Brian could pass through easily. She took an awkward step and tripped over the curb. Brian's reflexes kicked in and he quickly leaned forward 
to catch Tammy in his arms. Oh, I'm so clumsy, she exclaimed, hiding her embarrassment behind a laugh. It happens to everyone, it's okay. Brian reassured her, playing along. Tammy, why don't you come and visit us with Mr. Dunkelman? We can have tea together. Of course we'll come. Grandpa was just talking about something related to the roof. Tammy remembered and nodded in agreement. She waved goodbye and for some reason, Brian felt an unexpected joy, like that of a child. He pushed the wheelchair onto the porch, opened the door to the house, and the hungry cat immediately rushed inside. It was only then that Brian realised what had happened just a minute ago. It was the first time since the accident that he felt his legs. Whitney stretched out on the bed, with rays of sunlight streaming through the window. The clock showed that it was around ten in the morning. Ned was not around. He always left early, except on weekends. Work was the most important thing in the life of the director of a real estate agency, but Whitney was already considering resigning from her job. She was annoyed that Ned had not suggested it, especially since they were already in a relationship and he could support her financially. Whenever her colleagues called with questions about showing apartments to buyers, Whitney always made excuses. She was sick, busy, or had an urgent business trip. If he doesn't offer, then I should quit myself, Whitney decided while waiting for the coffee machine to brew. She liked Ned's house much better than her husband's apartment. It was quiet, spacious, and everything was conveniently within reach. There was a cleaning robot vacuum cleaner, a dishwasher, and everything else was automated to the maximum. It was always perfectly clean. Once a week, Ned hired a cleaning company to spotless the house. He couldn't stand dirt or clutter. Unlike Brian, he always took care of his appearance. All of this attracted Whitney. This was the life she wanted to live, the lifestyle she aspired to. She had already achieved the first part of her plan by becoming Ned's mistress. The next step was to gradually make herself indispensable in his personal space. Whitney was already eyeing Ned's second car, wondering if she needed a fur coat for the upcoming season, and considering when would be the best time to take a vacation. Her plans were ambitious. Whitney had a leisurely breakfast, took a shower, applied her makeup, called a cab, and left for work in a confident manner. You're coming to work like it's a holiday, the manager greeted her, raising an eyebrow in slight surprise. I'm not going to come to work any more, Whitney informed her, placing her resignation letter in front of her. Hmm, so you're leaving us to go freelance? Or have you found a better job? The manager put the resignation letter in a folder. You could say that, Whitney smiled mysteriously. She quickly gathered her belongings from the desk, bid her colleagues a curt farewell, and rushed out onto the street. It was wonderful how much determination Whitney had when the prospect of a relationship with a wealthy man presented itself. Whitney went home, dropped off her work things, and went shopping. The enterprising girl decided that a new set of beautiful lingerie would soften the blow of her resignation for Ned. In the evening, Whitney met her lover at his house and informed him of her decision. The man was surprised. Quit your job? But why? You didn't seem overly busy, and you always received your salary on time? Whitney flirtatiously sat on his lap. To spend more time with you. After all, a well-rested, beautiful, satisfied woman is better than a tired one. Well, that's true. But... What made you think that you were tired? Ned was genuinely perplexed. That's just how I felt. Whitney didn't like her lover's reaction. An awkward silence followed. But the man was the first to break it. I also wanted to talk to you about the holiday in May. I thought maybe we could go to the mountains, rent a cosy secluded house. What do you think of the idea? At the mention of mountains, Whitney's face almost twisted. She was tired of the mountains in her life with Brian. Ned, it might still be cold in the mountains, don't you know? Maybe we should spend a bit more and go to a warm place instead. Lying on the beach is better than getting dirty in the woods, don't you think? The man agreed, and Whitney realised that she had won. Brian was eagerly anticipating the tea party with his neighbours. 
considering it to be an important event. He was also thrilled by the return of some sensitivity in his legs. This rekindled his hopes of flying again, or at least being able to walk on the grass with his own feet. Brian opened a folder containing the doctor's prescriptions, carefully studied the instructions for therapeutic physical training, and began to exercise slowly. Brian's mother couldn't help but shed a tear of joy as she watched her son practice. Time will come and everything will work out as needed. She would sometimes tell herself in the evenings while tapping her knitting needles together. On a warm afternoon in mid-April, Mr. Dunkelman and Tammy appeared at their doorstep. The landlady invited them into the house, but the elderly man declined, saying that work should come first and only then tea. He inspected the edge of the roof and got down to business. Mrs. Saylor initially fussed around, but eventually bid them farewell and went to cook dinner. Brian and Tammy settled on the porch platform, ready to assist Mr. Dunkelman with any tools he might need. "'Your grandfather is wonderful, Tammy,' Brian said. "'I don't remember my grandfather. I was a toddler when he died.' "'I'm lucky,' Tammy nodded and smiled, glancing at her grandfather, who was diligently hammering. "'And yes, you're right. My grandpa is an example of diligence and optimism for the whole family.' "'It's quite noticeable,' Brian agreed. "'You're probably just like him.' Tammy tilted her head mischievously and looked up at Brian. "'In what way?' she asked, expectantly gazing at the guy. For some reason, Brian felt embarrassed, his heart racing. This simple and lively girl evoked feelings in him similar to the excitement of his first paraglider flight. "'You're easygoing, witty and kind,' Brian blurted out. She laughed and lightly rubbed Brian's shoulder. An hour later, Mrs. Saylor leaned out of the door and called out to everyone, "'Enough with the roof, Mr. Dunkelman, and you two, come in too. The dumplings are ready and hot.' "'Mrs. Saylor, all you care about is filling your stomach. People might have work to do in the middle of the day,' replied the elderly neighbour, busy with pliers. "'Grandfather, don't grumble. Let's go. Everything will get cold.' Tammy gently scolded him. She grabbed the handles of the wheelchair and confidently pushed it towards the entrance. Protesting, Brian said, "'What are you doing? Don't worry, I can do it.' "'Oh, let me take care of you,' Tammy giggled, not stopping. When the two of them went to wash their hands at the back of the house, Mrs. Saylor slowed down the neighbour who was following and whispered, "'There's something beautiful starting to bloom.' "'I'm not blind, I can see it,' Mr. Dunkelman mumbled in reply, and the neighbours exchanged understanding smiles. When the group gathered around the table, steaming homemade dumplings with garden cherries, strong tea and thick sour cream awaited them. Towards the end of the meal, Tammy secretly gave the cat a dumpling. "'Who's feeding the cat from the table?' Mrs. Saylor exclaimed indignant. Why don't you send them for a walk as punishment? The grandfather winked at the woman. Tammy and Brian looked at each other simultaneously. That's a great idea, the woman played along. The weather is nice. No need to sit around. Go and pick a bunch of primroses. Behind the village near the pond, there's a whole bed of them. After finishing their meal, Tammy and Brian leisurely walked along the road. Brian, so you can't walk at all? Tammy suddenly asked, then immediately apologised. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have asked that. It's inappropriate. Never mind, Brian replied calmly. The doctors say there are chances, but for now, yes, I can't do it at all. I've started doing exercises to regain sensation, but sometimes apathy takes over, and I feel like giving up and accepting everything. They say that human possibilities are limitless, and it's all about desire. Tammy looked at the sun, then at Brian. I hope that in time you will definitely stand on your feet. They talked and talked about paragliders and tourists, about the shortcomings of student dormitories and teachers, about the countryside and the city, about the joys of life and trivial problems. For the first time in many months after the accident, Brian felt alive. Suddenly, the wheelchair hit a rock and Brian yelped. Tammy stopped. Does it hurt? No, 
he looked up at her with a look of perplexed, breathless joy. But I think I can feel my leg a little. Tammy widened her eyes and squatted down next to him. She lightly squeezed his leg just above the knee. Brian felt a barely noticeable, unpleasant, dull pain, as if through a pillow. Barely, but he felt it. I can feel it, he whispered. I can feel it for sure. Tammy jumped up and laughed, then rushed to hug Brian. A tear ran down his cheek, either from joy, happiness, or maybe both. Whitney was dozing in a chair with headphones on. Ned was sitting next to her, looking at something on his laptop. Clouds flashed in the porthole. The plane was taking them home from their vacation. Whitney was satisfied. Abroad, she had convinced her lover to buy her some expensive gifts. Meanwhile, Ned never initiated a conversation about living together, but Whitney sincerely believed that this would happen. When the couple rested after the morning flight and drank coffee on the balcony, Whitney once again glanced at Ned's second car. I was thinking, maybe I could use your second car. Why do you need it? Ned looked at her questioningly, taking his eyes off the phone screen and his work correspondence. Oh, to the store, to run errands, to fitness, Whitney began curling her fingers. You can't do much in heels. Just wear sneakers or boots, they're more comfortable, Ned shrugged. And it's easier than buying a car. Why buy a car when you already have one? Whitney nodded at the blue fancy car. Ned followed her gaze and, after a pause, said, The car isn't running. I'm waiting for a new engine for it. Then I planned to repair it, sell it. Besides, you don't have any driving experience. I can gain experience, Whitney insisted, and we can always sell it. Whitney knew how to beg convincingly. Since high school, she had realised that it was easier to ask until she got what she wanted than to make an effort and exert herself. And any awkwardness could always be smoothed over later with feminine methods. So... Ned squeezed Whitney's fingers irritably. The car isn't running, so buy yourself a good pair of sneakers. Ned got up, took the mug with the remaining coffee from the table, and retired to his study, signalling that the subject was closed. Whitney grinned resentfully. She felt insulted by the recommendation, considering that beautiful shoes and stiletto boots had initially helped her win her lover. She remembered the kind and patient Brian, who couldn't give her a car, but never refused her other modest whims. A few days passed. She cooked a delicious dinner, brought good wine, and planned to bring up the topic of the car again. The evening passed in a cosy atmosphere, until Ned suggested watching a new movie. The screen showed the serene life of a family with two children. The father was playing frisbee with his son, and the mother was teaching her daughter to play the piano. A golden retriever was snoozing on the mat. "'I've always wanted a big family, too,' Ned suddenly said. "'To have both a son and a daughter. "'I started all this business so that my children would have wealth and not lack anything.' Whitney, who was lying on his lap, listened carefully. "'So, this was the ideal image of a wife for Ned. "'An educated working mother. "'Well, no, she didn't want to become that.' Why waste her youth and beauty on children when there are so many pleasures? Suddenly, she had an outstanding idea. A couple of days later, they had just sat down for breakfast when Whitney abruptly stood up from the table and desperately ran to the restroom. Are you okay? Ned anxiously knocked on the bathroom door. Just feeling dizzy and nauseous all of a sudden, Whitney replied. Ned looked at her with a mix of joy and anticipation. Maybe you're pregnant? It's obvious. Ned picked her up, sat her down on the living room couch and began to fan her. And if I am, would you be happy? Whitney put on the most naively righteous expression she could muster. Are you kidding? Of course. Ned crouched down on one knee in front of her. I've wanted kids for so long. Okay, I'll go to the doctor tomorrow and find out everything. She sighed and hugged the jubilant Ned. Whitney had already thought of how to simulate pregnancy 
until the belly appeared. Nausea, mood swings, dizziness and bouts of appetite were no problem. Soon, a familiar doctor wrote her the medical document that she was pregnant. Ned was jubilant, bustling with activity, and had already chosen a name for their future child. He immediately moved Whitney to his place. In the evenings, he perused strollers and cribs, endlessly discussing everything related to children. Whitney suppressed her true feelings and tried to find a moment to file for divorce with Brian, so she could freely get married to Ned. Time was running out and every day mattered. Tammy only came to the village on weekends because the rest of the time she was attending classes. Brian missed the girl, but he focused on writing a book and doing leg exercises. Tammy supported his enthusiasm in both endeavours. During the month of exercises, Brian managed to move his toes. In another two weeks, he was able to tilt his foot slightly and tense his lower leg. With each new achievement, his motivation and will to live seemed to return. One day, Brian sat in a wheelchair near the porch and basked in the sun with closed eyelids. Suddenly, someone's hands gently covered his eyelids. Tammy, did you think I wouldn't recognise you? Brian said, laughing. I've been sneaking silently, Tammy said and began to tickle Brian. He immediately laughed, shaking off the remnants of his midday slumber. Mrs. Saylor laughed, watching them fooling around. When the sun subsided, they all went into the house to drink tea. At the table, Brian discreetly placed his hand on Tammy's hand when his mother was busy putting jam. Tammy looked at him embarrassed but didn't remove his palm. Brian felt as if he had returned to the time of with his first dates. Mrs. Saylor saw what was happening at the table but didn't show it. Instead, she remembered some urgent business outside and left the kitchen. Tammy, I need to talk to you. Brian began, when he realised they were alone. The girl nodded and turned to him, completely on the stool. About what? About what's going on between us? Brian sighed and took her hand again. I really like you. You've become important to me, and you help me not to give up. I know you don't need a disabled person, and I'm married. Yes, my wife dumped me here like a worthless thing, but officially I'm still married. Instead of answering, Tammy hugged him tightly around the neck. I need you no matter what, and I'm sure you'll get out of that damn wheelchair and soon. And I care first and foremost about how you feel, not what's written in the documents. The man smiled at her and hugged the girl. Let's get you back on your feet already. Tammy kissed him on the cheek, and then everything will work itself out. One day, they were in the living room. Are you sure? Tammy looked at Brian with great care. Maybe we should wait. Yes, I'm sure. Brian leaned on the arm of the chair with all his strength. It's about time we tried it. Tammy stood and held out her arms to Brian. He cautiously started to rise, first on his elbows. His legs obeyed, but they felt weak. Only a quarter of the strength a healthy person would have. His knees felt like the rusted hinges of a long, unopened door. Is it difficult? Tammy watched him eagerly. No harder than learning to walk as a child, Brian muttered. He placed one foot on the floor, feeling the soft carpet beneath it. Then he cautiously placed the other foot down, releasing his grip on the armrests. Doubts flooded his mind. Brian closed his eyes and reminisced about his first paragliding flight, soaring through the clouds and the exhilarating embrace of the tree-covered slopes. Overwhelmed by long-forgotten sensations, Brian felt the support of Tammy and attempted to take a step. His leg felt foreign, as if cramped, but he persisted and slowly moved it forward. With sheer determination, one step led to another. With Tammy's encouragement, he managed to take a couple of feeble steps before wearily returning to his chair. You're amazing, Tammy hugged him. Let's go to the doctor and document your progress. Maybe they can give us some recommendations to accelerate the process. What was said was done, and a few days later they were sitting in the doctor's office. 
"'Well, you never cease to amaze,' exclaimed the doctor after the examination. "'At this rate, you could be running in six months. "'I've never seen patients recover so quickly from such injuries. "'It's a miracle, although we don't usually use that word in scientific circles. "'Keep up with the exercises. "'Regain the former mobility of all parts of your leg. "'I recommend trying to walk with support.' "'Inspired, Brian drove back home, his confidence growing.' In this hopeful state of mind, he received an unexpected phone call. Hello, Brian. Whitney's voice came through the receiver. I won't keep you long. Can we talk? Hi, what's going on? A lump formed in his chest, along with memories that had almost faded away. I've filed for divorce, Whitney informed him briefly. I don't think I need to explain why. You're a grown, intelligent man, you'll understand. Yes, I will. Brian confirmed her words. Good. I hope it can be finalised quickly. I'll vacate your apartment in a couple of weeks. Goodbye. Whitney hung up. Tammy overheard the conversation. She turned to Brian and whispered, It's for the best. Don't be upset. You said yourself that your marriage was just a formality. You're right, Brian nodded. But I did love her once. Whitney tapped her fingers contentedly, on the armrest of her chair. Everything was going according to plan. Brian agreed to the divorce, though he didn't have much choice. Ned adored her. The pregnancy had been confirmed with a certificate. She had her own bank card with enough money to fulfil any desire at any time. Perfect. What more could she want? Whitney felt like a queen, with everyone she had used in her pursuit of the perfect life, dancing to her tune. In the evening when Ned returned home, he first embraced Whitney and stroked her belly. She fed him a delicious dinner, poured wine and gave him a massage. When Ned warmed up, Whitney went on the attack. Ned, I really want our child to be born in a legal marriage. I grew up in a complete family and find fatherlessness unacceptable. I feel the same way, the man agreed. I wanted to discuss this matter as well. Then he pulled out of the briefcase a jewellery box and placed it in Whitney's hands. I wanted to do this properly, but since we're talking about it, why not? I agree, Whitney exclaimed, throwing her arms around Ned, while marvelling at the size of the stone in the ring. They decided to get married in three months. By the time of the wedding, Whitney planned to finalise her divorce from her ex-husband, and after the ceremony, she would fake a miscarriage. The trap would close securely and on time. Whitney realised it was time to push harder. She rested her head on her lover's chest and said, Ned, when my belly gets big, it will be difficult for me to get to the doctor and take care of other business. Maybe you'll reconsider getting a car for me. I could take a few lessons with an instructor to refresh my knowledge. What do you think? Maybe what you're saying makes sense, Ned thought. He put his hands behind his head and furrowed his brow. Whitney held her breath and peered expectantly from under her lashes. All right, he finally announced his decision. But we'll do things differently. I'll sell my car and buy you something more feminine. Sound good? Absolutely. Thank you, darling. Whitney squealed with delight and started hugging Ned again. Brian? You should go to the city and get that wretch's stuff out of the apartment, Mrs. Saylor said, as she placed a plate of rich soup in front of her son. You've been divorced for two weeks already, and you're still procrastinating. Mum, I'm not confident enough in my skills, Brian replied. Over the past month, Brian had made noticeable progress in rehabilitating his legs. He could now stand and sit with support. Walk slowly around the house with crutches. Then call Tammy. She goes to town every Monday anyway and she'll help you, advised Mrs. Saylor, sitting down opposite him at the table. It's not convenient for me. She's already here with me all the time as a caregiver, mumbled Brian. Mrs. Saylor placed her hand on his palm. Son, this girl loves you, unlike that city girl. Don't lose her. Girls like her are worth any money in the world. Everyone makes mistakes, but that doesn't mean you can't try again. Brian finished his soup, then took out his phone and dialed Tammy's number. 
Hi, I was wondering, would you go into the city with me soon? Maybe to check out the apartment? The guy spoke, twirling his spoon nervously. Of course, let's go, the girl agreed. Are you sure you can already manage without the stroller? I should, Brian assured her. Good, Tammy's voice warmed. Then I'll be ready on Saturday. I'm looking forward to it. Bye. Brian pressed the cancel button. Too soon. He wanted to say more, but once again, his childish embarrassment ruined everything. How surprised he would be to find Tammy feeling the same way, standing in the middle of the institute with a phone in her hand. I skipped the lesson to go with you, Tammy blurted out when they were already sitting on the train. Brian looked at her in surprise. He had decided for the first time not to take a wheelchair and use only crutches. Why? Instead of answering, Tammy kissed him on the cheek. He smiled into the measured, sleepy emptiness of the carriage, closed his eyes, and hugged Tammy tighter. The apartment, which Brian hadn't been to in almost seven months, echoed with the familiar turn of the key and the smell. Standing on the threshold, he inhaled it, hesitating to enter. The smell reminded him of tourism and flying. There, in the closet on the balcony, lay his paraglider in a case. Next to it, in a backpack, were his equipment, trekking boots, a camera for aerial photography and a helmet. Whitney's belongings were not in the apartment. Contrary to Mrs. Saylor's fears, she had taken every last cream jar, and, judging by the traces in the bathroom, it had been quite recent. She didn't even bother to clean up. Brian and Tammy ordered some food for delivery and started to clean up. The man tried to do everything himself but he periodically had to stop and rest. Tammy quickly tidied up the bathroom, rewashed the dusty dishes, vacuumed the floor, and wiped down the mirrors. You're doing an impressive job, she praised Brian as they sat down in the evening on the living room sofa with sandwiches and cups of tea. The doctor was right. You're getting better right before our eyes. I'm too well motivated, Brian joked looking at Tammy. She giggled and dropped the sausage in her lap. I am truly grateful for everything you do for me. Brian took a piece from his sandwich and transferred it to the girl's sandwich. But I'm also very drawn to the sky. I want to fly again and do what I love. Tammy furrowed her brow. She knew what had happened to Brian's partner and their touring car. Aren't you afraid of injuring your back again? Honestly, I'd go through it all again. Brian looked at her with a challenging look. Why? Tammy bowed her head, perplexed. To get to know you again. Brian leaned over, quickly pulled the girl to him, and kissed her. Whitney was diligently munching on pasta at the cafe during lunch with her friend. They had just visited a dozen wedding salons, looking for a dress for her and her bridesmaids. They had already chosen a restaurant, hired a photographer, and a presenter. The menu was determined and invitations were sent out to guests. "'Aren't you tired of pretending to have a baby bump?' the friend asked her while sipping cold juice from a tube. "'Tired, but what can I do?' Whitney grinned. "'You have a great catch,' her friend said dreamily. "'Ned is handsome, wealthy, and has everything, not like your former pilot.' "'Oh, don't remind me,' Whitney nodded, pushing her plate away. "'The man, in his thirties, and he was still fooling around, hiking in the mountains.' But it's okay, we're divorced now. He's forgotten, like a bad dream. What's your due date? Her friend nodded at her belly, grinning. And where do you get the papers for Ned to believe? Fifth month. I'm eating like crazy. I've already gained three kilograms. How will I lose it all later? Well, just for one more week of patience, and then we will have a grief. Whitney snorted. Jackie, my aunt's friend does it for me. Just today I need to visit her. You're a brave and smart woman, Whitney, admired her friend. I wouldn't dare do such a thing. If you want to survive, you must know how to be a predator. Whitney shrugged her shoulders. The girls paid for lunch and said goodbye. Whitney sat behind the wheel of a brand new red sedan while her friend waited for a cab. In thirty minutes she was sitting in a doctor's office. Their sweet conversation was interrupted by a phone call. Darling, where are you? greeted Ned on the other end of the line. I'm at my doctor's office. As soon as I'm done, I'll head straight home. 
said Whitney, affectionately. Great, I'm thinking of making risotto. Ask if you can have some, because there's wine in the recipe, Ned asked anxiously. Okay, I'll make sure to ask. Bye. Whitney tapped the screen without looking and slipped the smartphone into her purse. He is worried about my pregnancy, she muttered and laughed. Well, why do you mind? Jackie asked. You could really get pregnant, considering your age. And you already have the right man, as they say. You could hire a nanny and have a baby and a social status. Whitney wrinkled her nose as if she had bitten into an unripe orange. Are you kidding me? I'm already thinking about how to shed the extra weight. What if my belly really gets big? Stretch marks, swelling and a C-section? God forbid. Maybe someday, but not now. It's up to you, but I would do it for such a good husband. Jackie grinned. So what do you need? An ultrasound at 16 weeks. I'll find someone who recently had one at the same stage. She sat down at the machine, then back at the computer and began searching for matching data. After a couple of manipulations with dates and last names, the necessary documents were soon lying in front of Whitney. The girl gratefully slipped them into her bag and handed an envelope to Jackie. Have you already decided what to wear for the wedding? She asked. Yes, I've looked at a couple of options, the doctor replied. I'll use your gratitude on them. Laughter filled the office. Whitney entered the house upbeat. Weird, I thought he wanted to make risotto, Whitney thought, kicking off her shoes in the hallway. The house smelled like regular instead of Italian cuisine, and it was unusually quiet, with no sound of pots clattering or knives chopping in the kitchen. Whitney walked into the living room and saw Ned sitting in a chair. Did you decide to order food from a restaurant? Whitney tried to joke. Ned looked at her glumly. Give me the car keys. Why? Whitney asked, confused. Ned took a deep breath, then exhaled. Give me the car keys immediately, then go to the bedroom. Pack all your things, call a cab, and get the hell out of my life. Whitney cowardly shrank back, tears welling up in her eyes. She tried to speak. Ned, what's wrong? And tell your doctor that I'll make sure she loses her medical license. Or better yet, I'll sue her, Ned said, looking her in the eye. Whitney collapsed onto the carpet, her ears ringing and reality crashing down on her unprotected skin, burning and piercing her like hot needles. Ned squatted down beside her, took her chin and turned her face towards him. You wanted to use me for your own gain, right? And it didn't work out because of an incomplete phone call. Wow! How inconvenient that turned out to be. Such foolishness. Just imagine. Whitney burst into tears of shame, but Ned no longer cared. Whitney remembered that evening as if it were a fog. She hastily packed her belongings into suitcases and bags in just 15 minutes without even attempting to apologize, knowing it would be pointless. The offended director of the real estate agency made sarcastic remarks about her, drinking wine and silently observing as she frantically gathered her things. Before leaving, he took back all the expensive gifts he had given her, watches, jewellery and branded items. Whitney walked out of the gate with the same set of possessions she had arrived with a few months ago. So are you ready? Tammy stood in front of Brian, gripping his hands tightly. Ready, my captain, the man exclaimed laughing, as he placed a hand on his helmeted head. The paraglider airstrip stretched out before them. Beyond it, the autumnal mountain scenery loomed in unbelievable beauty. The slopes were adorned in a spectrum of colours from ochre to scarlet, as if painted by the sun. The grey-brown stones subdued the riot of autumn hues. It was the end of September. When you land, don't put your feet down abruptly. Keep them up, we'll catch you. Sean advised Brian, adjusting his straps. What are you fussing about? Tom, the instructor, who had once taught Brian, peeked out from behind the passenger cradle. He won't be flying until next season at the earliest. For now, I'm in charge. Okay, okay, let's not argue. Sean raised his palms and stepped away from the runway with Tammy. Let's go. Brian grabbed the safety harness and eagerly moved forward. Tammy gasped as the paraglider 
caught the wind and started to ascend, swaying gently. Sean shielded his eyes from the sun with his palm and muttered approvingly, Oh, good. Keep it up. Good. I'm still worried about him. Tammy nervously rubbed her fingers together. Let it go. Sean patted her on the shoulder. Tom is the best of the best. He will safely bring your beloved back to the ground. Tammy glanced at the brightly coloured dome of the paraglider, which had already risen even higher. Let's go to the lower area. That's where they'll land. Sean motioned for the girl to follow the path. And when will you fly yourself? Ah, oh, wait. Brian needs to fully recover, she replied. I trust only him. Besides, it's so wonderful, amazing and beautiful here. She spread her arms wide and took in a deep breath, the air still warm and clean, but with a hint of autumn's chill. Sean laughed. You haven't gone rafting with us yet, or ridden quad bikes in the mud. That's where you can experience all the charms of wild tourism. After a lively conversation, they reached the lower site, where there were tents with a thermos of herbal tea and sandwiches. During the past summer, Brian and Tammy's lives changed a lot. They sold the apartment in the city and bought a smaller one further away from the center. With the remaining money, they opened the agency of the author's travels. Tammy took charge of the company's information part, handling advertising, phone calls and documentation. Brian couldn't work as an instructor yet, as he had not fully recovered from his injury, but he gladly told tourists about the best places to visit and gave copies of his book with autographs to the most curious. The most significant change was in Tammy and Brian's relationship. They were now officially together. There was no extravagant wedding, expensive gifts or typical white dress. The couple simply signed the papers, spent time with loved ones and headed to the mountains the same evening. By the time of the wedding, Brian no longer needed crutches or a wheelchair. He only walked with a cane. It's so good to be here again, and everything is just like before. Sean stretched noisily with a satisfied face. Almost the same, Tammy corrected him. I apologise generously. Sean made an apologetic gesture with his hand. Suddenly, Brian's phone, which was in Sean's pocket, got an incoming call. Sean deftly took out the device and put it to his ear. Hi. No, it's not Brian. He's flying. Sean winked at Tammy, who listened with interest to this half-hearted dialogue. How does he fly? Just like before. He's already recovered. What? I think that's an irrelevant question. He's already married and loves her very much. Bye. Sean put the phone away. Who was that? Tammy asked curiously. Oh, it's just someone like a fallen star. Sean waved his hands indefinitely in a direction. Suddenly he jumped up from his seat and shouted, They're coming! Catch him! Tammy jumped up and rushed after Sean. With Tom's help, they safely brought Brian back to solid ground. He was unhooked from the harness and he collapsed on the grass, spreading his arms and looking up at the pale blue sky with scattered clouds. Alive? Tammy asked, laughing. Alive? As alive as I've never been. Brian blurted out, absolutely happy.